So today we draw towards the end of the course. Uh, it seems like just a little while ago we were talking about Jean-Jacques Rousseau and uh, Immanuel Kant, but today uh, we are moving on to three American thinkers. Uh, we have uh, not said much about American thinkers in this class except for Emerson and Judith Butler, but uh, today we're going to be talking about Richard Rorty and uh, Cornel West and Anthony Appiah, uh, three uh, uh, more or less contemporary intellectuals. Uh, Richard Rorty died a few years ago. Cornel West and Anthony Appiah still uh, very productive uh, scholars and uh, still putting out work uh, in cultural criticism and philosophy and uh, related domains on a regular basis. We ended last time talking about Zizek and talking about how he approached uh, what he calls sometimes postmodern authority or um, uh, postmodern uh, a desire. And when I've talked about Zizek in class, uh, uh, I, uh, I always get questions uh, along the lines of, so what does he expect people to do uh, with the uh, insights that he um, says he's giving us into how the contemporary world works? And uh, Zizek does not recommend anything in particular. I think that should be clear from the reading and from the film clips that we've, I've asked you to look at, and there are quite a lot of uh, videos about um, uh, Zizek on, uh, available online now and you can get a sense of his style of philosophizing and his style of philosophizing is to um, play the role of a really of a psychoanalyst of asking us what we think we're doing when we do X. What do, you, do we really think is going on when we do Y or do Z? Because his approach is less to uh, find a path that we could agree with than to show how our easy agreement, uh, be that about democracy or about diversity or about egalitarianism, that those kinds of commonsensical agreements mask desires that are uh, twisted, that are bound up with repression and with uh, uh, diversions um, and uh, with assumptions about uh, uh, meaning and, and uh, uh, direction uh, that are unfounded. And when we discover those things, um, it's really up to us what we're doing, what we, what we, how we might react to our discovery of the relation uh, of our desires to the world. And uh, Zizek leaves us in that space where we uh, understand better the confusion of our own desires, what, what Freud called the ambivalence of our situation as desiring human beings. And when we confront that, um, uh, that's where Zizek leaves us in a way. Uh, uh, it leaves us with uh, uh, an acknowledgement of uh, our uh, contradictory, our uh, conflicted place uh, in the world. Uh, Richard Rorty um, uh, has a very different approach. Uh, when you look at the, uh, these, these uh, um, film clips, you'll see where Zizek is animated and he's uh, uh, provocative and he's, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's, make, he's stirring things up. Uh, Richard Rorty, who I think I've told you already was my teacher uh, uh, in graduate school at, at Princeton. Richard Rorty is he's, he's sitting back in his chair. He's talking rather laconically about that truth isn't that important. <laughs> and so it's a very different um, affect, a different, a different presentation of emotion um, because what he really wants to do uh, in his work is to deflate the pretensions of philosophy and critical theory. The, the idea is, I mean, the Greek idea is that at a certain point in the process of inquiry, you come to rest because you've reached the goal. And the pragmatists are saying, we haven't the slightest idea what it would be like to reach the goal. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that the aim of inquiry is, you know, conformity to re correspondence to reality or seeing the face of God or substituting facts for interpretations is one that we just can't make any use of. All we really know about is how to exchange justifications of our beliefs and desires with other human beings and as far as we can see that will be what human life will be like forever. So. Pragmatists regard the Platonist attempt to get away from time into eternity or get away from conversation into certainty as a product of 
an age of human history where life on Earth was so desperate and it seemed so unlikely that life could ever be better that people took refuge in another world. Mm -hmm. Pragmatism comes along with things like the French Revolution, industrial technology, all the things that made the 19th century believe in progress. Uh, when you think that the aim of life is to make things better for our descendants rather than to reach outside of history and time, it alters your sense of what philosophy is good for. In, in, in the Platonist and theistic epoch, uh, the point of philosophy was to get you out of this mess into a better place. And God, God, has, uh, the, the uh, realm, the realm of Platonic ideas, um, the the, con the contemplative life, something like that, and uh, the reaction against this Greek Christian pursuit of blessedness through union with a natural order is to say there isn't any natural order, but there is the possibility of a better life for our great 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 grandchildren. That's enough to give you, you know, all the meaning or inspiration or whatever that you could use. Hans Blumenberg, in a remark that impressed me enormously, said, at some point we stopped hoping for immortality and in place started hoping for our great-great-grandchildren. You know, this was a sort of turn in, in the culture of the West, and you know, I really believe that. I, mean, I think that it had to do with simple improvement of material conditions. You know, when we got a comfortable bourgeois existence for you know, large numbers of people, the bourgeoisie was able to think not about escape from the world and pie in the sky, but about creating a future mortal, future world for future mortals. This seems to me to have been you know, a great improvement. And the text I have assigned for this uh, class, a small thing called uh, postmodern uh, uh, bourgeois liberalism, it's a, um, uh, it's a, he thinks of it as a, as a contradiction in terms, that is he, he wants to show that the postmodern response to the death of philosophy or the, the realization that epistemology isn't uh, necessary or significant, that the postmodern response to that isn't radicalism, but it actually may be a commitment to the, uh, the best aspects of our contemporary situation, and, and it doesn't necessarily demand a revolutionary response. In fact, it, the response can be um, uh, liberal uh, in, um, in the mainstream sense of that word. So, um, uh, Rorty in this text that I've assigned in the class talks about a three-cornered debate. Remember that? A three-cornered debate. Um, uh, the first uh, uh, piece is uh, those who want to provide foundations to support our institutions. The, the second is those who want to show that the foundations are weak um, a, a, so that we can change those uh, institutions. And the third are those who don't think there are foundations, but the institutions are okay. And, and for Rorty, those are the three positions. Um, the first let's support what's going on with, buttress those foundations. And the second is say, aha, there are no foundations. This would be the Zizek and to some extent the Judith Butler uh, response. There are no foundations. You see, these institutions are shaky. These institutions are, we can make them fall. And the third, which is Rorty's, is there are no foundations and that's okay because institutions are great. They can be a little better. We can tinker with them. We can make them better, but you know, they've never needed foundations. So in some ways, Rorty's is the most radical philosophically that say these foundations were never necessary. We used to think they were. We used to think they were, but now we can see the foundations aren't necessary. But that doesn't mean we have to change the game we're playing. And here I use that word game to, to hearken back to Wittgenstein because remember Wittgenstein talked about um, the, the rules of the game are within the game itself. They, uh, they don't get established outside the game. And so for Rorty, when you realize that there's no foundation to the game, it doesn't mean you stop playing. If you think the game is helping you cope with reality, if you think the game is bringing you pleasure or satisfaction, if you think the game is good for the people playing, you continue to play. Um, and um, you have to answer those questions uh, within the vocabulary of the game itself. Uh, 
So uh, he said he knows that this post postmodern bourgeois liberalism sounds uh, like an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms. I have this quotation for you. Uh, I hope thereby to suggest, Rorty writes, how such liberals might convince our society that loyalty to itself is morality enough. That's the key for him. Loyalty to itself is morality enough, and that such loyalty is no longer needs an ahistorical backdrop. I think they should try to clear themselves of charges of irresponsibility by convincing our society that it need be responsible only to its own traditions and not to the moral law as well. And so for Rorty, again, there are no foundations, but that doesn't mean things are about to fall down because they've actually never been necessary, those foundations. Rationality for Rorty, as he says uh, a little later in the piece, is a, a product of um, uh, participation in a community. Rational, rational behavior uh, is just adaptive behavior. That, that's really key for Rorty. It doesn't conform to some external ahistorical standard. Rational behavior, this is I think from page 333, is just adaptive behavior, the kind of thing others like us would do in similar circumstances. So rationality is always dependent on the group you're in. As he says in that same page, irrationality in both physics and ethics is a matter of behavior that leads one to abandon or be stripped of membership in a community. Irrationality is a decision made by a community about someone's aberrant behavior, not a violation of epistemology. So um, no vocabularies are privileged uh, against other vocabularies uh, from Rorty's perspective. I think it was unfortunate that pragmatism became thought of as a theory or definition of truth. I think it would, be, would have been better if the pragmatist had said, we can tell you about justification, but we can't tell you about truth. There's nothing to be said about it. <laughs> that is, we know how we justify beliefs. We know that the adjective true is the word we apply to the beliefs that we've justified. We know that a belief can be true without being justified. That's about all we know about truth. And you know, justification is relative to an audience and to a range of truth candidates. Truth isn't relative to anything. Just because it isn't relative to anything, there's nothing to be said about it. <laughs> And tr truth with a capital T is sort of like God. Uh, you know, there's not much you can say about God. That's why theologians talk about ineffability. Contemporary pragmatists tend to say the word true is indefinable, but none the worse for that. We know how to use it. We don't have to define it. Uh, if you define it in the, the, the Nietzschean term, uh, there are no facts, there are only interpretations. Yeah, is that that gives the general pragmatist idea that no description or if you like no interpretation is closer to reality than any other some of them are more useful for some purposes than others but that's about all you can say and Nietzschean perspectivism which says you know you can't rise above interpretations and get to facts or dig down below interpretations and get to facts is substantially the same thing as I meant before when I said the pragmatists try to get rid of the reality appearance distinction. So he says that what he wants to have happen is to have art and literature uh, become uh, the backup for our moral decisions rather than the philosophical search for foundations. The moral justification of institutions and practices of one's groups is mostly a matter of uh, historical narratives rather than philosophical meta-narratives. Now, what does he mean by philosophical meta-narrative? He means that uh, we should stop chasing a, a um, framework that is supposed to give support to all other stories. That's what he means by a meta-narrative, a narrative, a story, a big story. <laughs> it's supposed to support all the small ones. There is no big story for Rorty. And the, the second part of that is, and that's okay. <laughs> you know, this is, uh, there is no big other, to use Zizek's term, and that's okay. We never actually needed one. We actually never re needed one. And now, uh, the charge that you'd expect people to make against him in this circumstance is, uh, is a charge that uh, he's being relativist, right? Uh, that he's being a relativist because he's somehow um, not giving us criteria according to which we can choose among competing vocabulary. But Rorty's point is relativism only makes sense if you think there's a place from outside of these vocabularies to judge them. In other words, if you think you can somehow step out of history to make a judgment about the various groups. 
If you could step out of history and you couldn't decide which group you should join, then you would be in this relativist position. But for Rorty, you, no one is ever outside of a vocabulary making a decision. You're always already within a language game. You're always already within a community. And so there is no perspective from which you could be a relativist. Relativism uh, as a charge depends on a notion of a God's eye view, which is always unavailable to us. <laughs>